waste. He's also an experienced environmental journalist with a focus on marine environmental issues. So over to you, Tim Do you want to hear very much? Oh, Can you hear me? I'm quite good at talking loud. Says so anybody can't hear me. All right, everybody can hear me, don't bother. Um, thank you. Um, right, I started, I got involved with um, looking at liquid radioactive waste in 1983. Well, I listened to the radio one day and there was a major leak from the Sellafield site. And Sellafield's bosses got up and said, well, we don't know where this leak will go and how it will behave in the marine environment. I could not believe that they had elected to discharge huge amounts of radioactivity, both in volume and aggregated radioactivity terms, without being able to say where it went from. So I started getting involved in, 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 in this work. Um, and what I'm going to do now is to give you a presentation. Please don't get too involved with reading my slides, because actually they are aid memoirs for me, rather than attractive things for you to look at. Do if you want to but um, they're a bit dense. Um, what I'm going to do is to take you, first of all, through the history and the outline and the structures behind the decision of the British government and the nuclear industry to discharge radioactive wastes, and then to start to tease out some of the mistakes that they made and to show you the very real anomalies and dichotomies that exist between the nuclear industry and pro-nuclear government agencies position on the fate and behaviour and impacts of marine radioactivity and what we as independent academics and researchers working for anti-nuclear groups have been able to discover. Right, so here's the first slide which is very quick and just to say that in common with many industries over the last three or four hundred years the nuclear industry has opted to deal with its pollution problem by exporting it. Up chimneys, down pipelines. Um, you'll see the third line, the fourth line there is saying in the late 1940s and the 50s there was a real push to make a bomb and to disguise the efforts of making a bomb by talking about civil nuclear energy and atoms for peace and this meant that you couldn't, but they found that they couldn't do that without having liquid discharges and gaseous discharges so there was a huge pressure on the UK government to um, allow discharges of very large volumes and high aggregate radioactivity into the sea. Uh, but this was, as the last line says, in the total absence of any empirical data on behaviour and fate of radioactivity in natural aquatic environments. In the 1940s and 50s, oceanography was in its infancy, let alone the study of radioactivity. So that's the situation that pertained. And lo and behold, a hypothesis was conjured up out of pretty much nothing because there was no empirical evidence. So they came up with a hypothesis and these are the clauses of the hypothesis. You had soluble radioactivity which would dissolve and dilute to infinity or background levels and you had insoluble radioactivity which wouldn't dissolve but it would float around and then sink out of the water column and get locked into sediments, sedimentary deposits close to the end of the pipelines from which it was being discharged. And so they used this hypothesis to ju justify atmospheric and aquatic discharges. And round about 1952, the first discharges to sea began. That wasn't a democratic decision. It was done by order of council through the Ministry of Supply. So ministers and MPs and the public didn't get to debate on it. It was just passed under the counter, as it were, and away it went. So the outcomes of that were, you had your hypothesis which said liquid, um, soluble, dissolvable stuff will dilute and dissolve, and soluble stuff will fall to the seabed near the end of the pipeline and remain locked there, sequestered from exposure to human beings. So this uh, allowed um, an assumption, a set of general assumptions. First general assumption was that the highest levels in the marine environment would occur closest to the point of discharge. Uh, the second, and so the monitoring programs were constructed all very close to the power stations. Okay, so that was one thing. And then the second one was that if you were discharging radioactivity into the sea, it was assumed that your various population groups who would be exposed would be the four, the seafood eaters, the marine workers, the sportsmen, and the users of the foreshores and intertidal. Well, in the absence of any information, 
and any serious study, that didn't look too bad. So on that basis, major dose pathways were identified on those criteria, and coastal groups, who were in coastal critical groups, who are the people who are most likely to be exposed, were identified by the officials, by the nuclear industry and pro-nuclear governments. But it became worse than that because this justifying hypothesis, which had no, I keep saying it, but it had no empirical basis to it at all, became embedded as an academic description of the behaviour and fate of marine radioactivity and is still being taught as such in some university departments. All right? Now, obviously, if you're going to have a nuclear industry, you need to have highly qualified people. So as soon as the nuclear industry commenced its work, you started to have graduate programmes and undergraduate programmes, and they got taught the justifying hypothesis. These emerging graduates entered into the industry, so it's no surprise that the guys you deal with at Hinkley or at any other nuclear power station are feeding you this justifying hypothesis, which has no empirical evidence, because that's what they were taught at university. Similarly, work experience graduates from the industry entered or were seconded to government departments and regulating bodies. So when you're dealing with the, with the Environment Agency and you're talking to them about marine radioactivity, they were educated on the basis of the justifying, justifying hypothesis. They don't like it if you ask them how much empirical evidence was there behind that because they don't know. They were told it was this, this is how it works. But actually, when you study it and poke around, you find that it is actually, as I say, it's just a hypothesis. So, as a result of one, two, three bullet points, number four means that the justifying hypothesis has become fully integrated into all levels of nuclear thinking. So when we go and we say to them, why do we think we observe nuclear, um, nuclear pollution causing cancer clusters or ill health clusters in certain parts of the coastal environment, they say straight off the top of their heads, well it can't be marine radioactivity because marine radioactivity doesn't cause these problems because of the justifying hypothesis. So it's very interesting and, and I mean that has been the case that as I say there, in 1958 it was actually publicly stated by the head of the United Kingdom Atomic Energy Authority that sea discharges had been an ongoing experiment which backs up what I'm telling you. The, the original hypothesis for discharge had no empirical evidence. That's why they were carrying on a, an experiment to discover how the radioactivity would behave as late as 1958 and in fact they still are doing it now. Okay, so they were doing their monitoring around nuclear power stations because that was where they had identified that the major problem was without actually understanding what was going on. So they began, as they were doing this monitoring, they began to discover one or two things which made them feel that they ought to look further and further afield, and so they started to look further afield. What they discovered was soluble radioactivity doesn't dilute and disperse to infinity or background. In fact, as you probably some of you know, you can detect Sellafield derived cesium-137 from sea discharges is now detectable in the Pacific. All right, so it doesn't dilute and disperse to infinity. It actually hangs around and can be detected thousands of miles away from the point source of input. Furthermore, work on some of the local monitoring, but also laboratory studies, etc., etc., show that marine radioactivity reconcentrates in marine wildlife in estuarine and marine sediments and sea spray and marine aerosols. But they didn't really look at it in great depth and I'll have another slide in a minute which will study that. Similarly, insoluble radioactivity doesn't remain bonded to seabed sediments because any fool can tell you that seabed, seabed sediments are infinitely susceptible to disturbance and transport. You have a big, big wave climber for three or four days on the, on the Hinkley foreshore and it'll make your water look a lot more turbid from the air because it'll stir up all that sediment. And once that sediment is stirred up and suspended in the water column, it's then available for transport in the water column. And I've got maps which I'll show you later on. Similarly, insoluble radioactivity reconcentrates in marine wildlife and um, estuarine sediments and so on and so on. And some of this stuff, the EFs is an enrichment factor 450 for americium 241 which is closely related to plutonium 
and not at all a nice thing to be having floating around. So in marine biota and sea spray and marine aerosols, americium can reconcentrate 450 times higher than it is in the water column. All right? So that's, that's, that's a, a, I, can't, I haven't got the time to explain to you why, but take it from me, the, the industry have discovered it and we've been working on it as well. Okay, so there's big holes in the official research effort. Um, uh, we, we heard earlier on that um, the PWR that's proposed here at EPC um, um, has got a lot of radioactivity in it, and in fact it has, according to the GDA produced by the Environment Agency, it has 59 to 60 radionuclides in the liquid discharges, right? So it's different radioisotopes, okay? So the Environment Agency, or I've said they say 59, but um, EPR said 60 in one of their papers. But I've looked through the data um, and the, the study lists for those 59 radionuclides that the, the Environment Agency is going to be discharged, and I can only find research on marine fate and behaviour for 24 of them. All right, so the remaining number hasn't been researched in marine environments, and we don't know how it behaves, we don't know what its impact on wildlife is, and we don't know whether it can come back to us in any form or not. And, and so that's an interesting point, isn't it? So they're telling us that the discharges are harmless and not to worry, but actually they only know anything about 24 of them in terms of their behaviour in marine environments. Okay, so you've got insufficient research data, but you've got these things being discharged. One of the other things that I've been working on is sea-to-land transfer. And I started working on sea-to-land transfer in, the, in, in, in um, the very early 80s. Um, and I did notice that my major sense of victory came that since in the early 1990s, the radioactivity in food reports, which is the annual report produced by the Environment Agency, um, and um, SEPA and Food Standards Agency and so on and so on, did actually have a paragraph which finally admitted that sea to land transfer was taking place, but said that it was minimal. There's this quote. There was a great activity in marine environments give rise to only very minor doses. All right, but when I reviewed the reference that they gave me, the reference was a 1981 paper which actually had only studied two radioisotopes cesium and plutonium. And the study said that the equipment used by the researchers was inefficient and not appropriate for quantification, i.e. saying how much of it there was in the air at the time. And, it, and the, the conclusions used old, outmoded ICRP values. Um, and there, there's, the, there's the blurb about that. So, um, uh, and we've had no later corrections and updates, and this is still being, that comment, give rise to only very minor exposures, is still being put into the annual reports now. And I, th this piece of data that I've got on this slide, I pushed this at the Environment Agency um, well over eight years ago, and they don't even bother to reply. They don't want to engage with these things. The industry, the government, and DECC and ONR don't want to talk about these things and their attitude about it is it's not to jump on you and rubbish you it's to ignore it completely so I feel that we're probably on to something with this stuff okay estuarine monitoring so this is very germane to what's happening here um, in Hinkley you've got a number of estuaries here you've got the Parrot, you've got the Brew, you've got Huntsville River, you've got the Axe up by West, uh, up by Western and so on and so on now what I discovered was that they don't like to look at estuaries because estuaries actually, well, I don't know whether they don't like to do it because or whether they just haven't done it. But anyway, the point is that here's, here's the Cree estuary on the Solway coast in Scotland, 50 miles from Sellafield. MAF and the current Rife Report people annually monitor a particular point on the seaward end eye at the mouth of the estuary, okay? And here are the figures. 310 becquerels of cesium-137 and 87 becquerels to the kilogram of americium-241. But a group that I knew who was working on this looked at this in 1985. And they did their own sampling of the inland extent, i.e. the land, you know, the innermost, furthest away from the sea, 
end of the estuary, and instead of 310, they found they had 2,982. And similarly, instead of 87 for Amorisium, they had 715. Okay, so if you look at the inner end of an estuary, you find this massive enrichment factor, the, the radioactivity in the inner end of an estuary is 9, 8, 5, look at the, the second set of data, or 10 times greater than it is at the mouth. So if the authorities are only measuring at the mouth of an estuary, you're being shortchanged in terms of the data that you know about how much radioactivity is there in that estuary and what might its potential health impacts be. So that's a major flaw there. And again, this is another issue that the authorities don't want to take aboard and address and argue or discuss. <coughs> okay, so we go give you some brief um, case studies of sea to land transfer. In 1990, in Tawin, a town on North Wales, there was a major storm surge, a bit like the one you had in 2014 here. We had a lot of rain, we had a huge storm, we had excess high tides. Um, the the um, Tawin, Tawin was overwhelmed by um, big waves that came in, um, bringing in hundreds of tons of sediment from the coast, um, the offshore coastal sediment deposits. Extensive flooding of the coastal strip, blah, blah, blah. Some bright spark, not the Environment Agency, but a local campaigner, took samples of the sediment that came in and contaminated the, the, the town and the caravans and the houses and the business premises. And lo and behold, um, over 50% of them were found to contain this americium 241, which as I said earlier is a relative of plutonium and just about as unhealthy for you as plutonium is. And the levels were found to be 10 times the official generalised derived limit for urban areas. Now, general GDL is, if you have it, you've got to take action. If you observe a GDL of radioactivity, then you're supposed to do something. But nobody knew what to do, so nobody did anything. So it was just cleaned up as you would clean up any post-flooding sediment. But the consultants stated that given the context of americium that was there, plutonium was probably there as well because the two are often found, almost always found in the same environment to similar concentrations. It's just that americium is cheaper to monitor than plutonium is, so that's why independents and campaigning groups tend to monitor americium rather than plutonium. And the consultants say that when those sediments dry out, there is a risk of radiation hazard due to inhalation of the radioactive dust. Okay, so that's for those people who were doing the cleanup, which lasted for several weeks after this flood, uh, they were probably exposed to inhalation risk. And I just remind you that you've got extensive areas of the Bristol Channel, both the English coast and the Welsh coast, which are very low-lying and flood on a frequent stroke regular basis. And I'd also say that the 17th century, um, the famous um, 17th century flood, which also got both sides of the Bristol Channel and caused a lot of devastation in Somerset here, it wasn't an earthquake. It was a slump-derived tsunami. Um, two guys at the um, uh, University of West of England have fairly recently produced a paper which says that that happened, as I say, not because of an earthquake, but because of um, sediments moving out of the British and the Irish coastal waters and building up on the edge of the continental shelf. And then eventually it built up to such an extent that it rolled over and fell into the continental deeps, and that's what caused the tsunami. Okay, now that could happen again. We can't sit here and say in the west of England or the west of Wales where I come from that because we have an earthquake inactive area we won't have tsunamis or tsunami type events because they could be derived from slums as well. Another, another set of case studies. Right. In um, 1986, I took samples of my local estuary in West Wales, which had never, never, ever, we were on a 200 kilometre stretch of coast in which no marine radioactive activity sampling had ever been done, despite the fact that to the south of us, we had the Bristol Channel radioactivity complex, and to the north of us, we had Liverpool Bay with Sellafield and the fuel factories and several reactors there generating as well. So we took we, uh, we took some sediments from our estuary and had them analysed and we were 200 miles away from Sellafield and we discovered that we had Sellafield derived radioactivity and plutonium in our estuary. 
like the other diagram, it got worse as you went further away from the sea. It got ten times higher on the inland levels. We discovered that it was blowing ashore and you could find it in lichen, in trees, in the valley. And the further away you went from the estuary, the lower the levels got. So we were fairly happy that we were witnessing sea to land transfer. We took that to our county council and made a campaign out of it and forced our county council to initiate their own radiation monitoring program, which was Radley Radiation Monitoring in Dublin. Um, so they did their work and they discovered that 10 miles inland on pasture grass, which was being eaten by dairy cattle and sheep and beef cattle, you had Cellophia derived cesium, which could only have got there um, as a result of uh, um, blowing from the sea to the land, because there's a particular fingerprint between cesium 137 and 134, which only Cellophia sea discharges have. And when you find it, you can say, well, that originated from a Cellophia sea discharge. So we knew it was Cellophile sea discharges. We knew it had to have come from the sea. We assumed, because we're on a prevailing wind coast, you know, all of the, a lot of the Wales coast faces west or southwest. Uh, we, we, we were fairly certain that that's what it was. So we, but then we, we, we realised that if it was on um, into the, de into the, um, the meat stock and dairy food chain, because it was precipitating out on grass, then as an area which grows a lot of potatoes and a lot of leeks, it was probably on potatoes and the leeks as well. And that actually then, of course, you realise that if it's blowing about and falling on pasture grass and so on, then it's in the air, so it's available for people to breathe too. So we assumed that there were a number of dose pathways by which people could be exposed to this sea to land transferred material up to 10 miles inland, and it didn't, it wasn't that it wasn't found at 11 miles, it was that the monitoring stopped at 10 miles inland, so there might have been more further inland. So here's another one, this is even worse. This was before, um, this, and this, this was a study which was published in the British Medical Journal in 1991, but, the, but the, 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 the work had been done before the Chernobyl accident. It looked again at Sellafield derived cesium, um, and it's the only empirical, the only empirical data on radioactivity in the environment as it affects human beings anywhere in Britain other than weapons test. Okay, and what these guys did, they were, they were working on North Uist in the Hebrides. Um, one of the doctors who was doing, they were, they were a team of, of GPs, one of the doctors who was doing it had friends who worked in the Kilbride Reactor Centre. So all of his human subjects were sent to the reactor Kilbride Center and given whole body radiation monitoring. They were, urine analysis was conducted on their urine. All their dietary materials were taken and analyzed at Strathclyde University as well. So it was, a, it was a pretty good study and what it had over everything that the Environment Agency and the British government have done um, was that it was empirical. It was genuine evidence or an hypothesis. So what they discovered was that the whole island, um, this is it's an island on the inner Hebrides, um, quite, quite a way up the west coast of Scotland, the whole island was saturated with Cellophane sea discharge seasons, 137 and 134. Um, every type of land produce, everything that the crofters was growing, so meat, uh, dairy, vegetables, honey, um, and so on and so on, it was all covered with sea to land transferred seasons. Uh, they found that the people who ate shop food that was brought in by truck um, had lower doses than the people who ate the traditional crofting island diet. They found that the highest individual dose on the island came from a man who ate lots and lots of local land produce but hated fish and never ate fish. But this is sea radioactivity, this is marine discharge radioactivity. So people on Uist were getting bigger doses of sea discharge radioactivity from eating land food than they were from eating seafoods. Okay, that's a really important point to realise. Tim, five minutes. Right. The average islander dose, right, okay. <laughs> Right, so what you've got here in the Bristol Channel, when I looked at the GDA, which the Environment Agency produced for Hinkley, they said, okay, we know all about everything, it's all right, don't worry. But as soon as you start looking at it, you realise that the Bristol Channel actually isn't the right place to put a nuclear power station because it's got Cardiff, 
two plus an old one sites producing radioactivity. You've got old Reed Barclay, Hinkley's 2 and the future Hinkley C here. It's a semi-enclosed sea area. It doesn't flush itself quickly. It's, so you've got an extended lifespan of radioactivity waste in the system. You've got very high sediment loading, which is great for, cert, for the insoluble radioactivities to adsorb to the outside of and get built up in um, sedimentary deposits. You've got lots of freshwater inputs which cause electrochemistry which assist the adsorption. You've got big intertidal deposits of all this stuff. You've got a, a, a whole load of estuaries with lots of fine sediment as well. And the water column movement delivers radiation to all Bristol Channel coasts. And there's a little map of it. So you can see the water enters the Bristol Channel along the north coast of the English West Country, i.e. coming in past Devon, running across there. Gets up to the sediment estuary, the area that I've hatched. That's the turbidity maximum where the sediments are highest. Uh, you can see that um, just here, this is Hinkley, and there's Bridgewater Bay with its sediments. There's a big dollop of sediment. There's extensive intertidal sediments all the way along the edge here, as well as this water body is brown because it's so much sediment in it. There's a big sediment deposit there. You've got big sedimentary deposits over here. All these are going to be holding marine radioactivity discharged from Hinkley and then also attracting the radioactivity from other sites. There's the, there's the sat path or, or the, the land sat. And again, you can see, there's Hinkley. And you can see that Hinkley's sitting there at the beginning of the maximum turbidity. And all this stuff here, all this suspended sediment will have lots and lots of radioactivity attached to it. Recent research coming out in 2010 and 2011, not referenced by the Environment Agency in their GDA on the, on the EPR, not referenced by um, um, Arriva and co who are making the EPR. This research said that the research on the Bristol Channel is several decades old, it needs updating. There's a lot of stuff there which is inaccurate and remains unknown or unclear. Uh, and there's a list of what they are. Um, uh, and that you've really got to get on top of these to improve your pollution management system in the Bristol Channel system. Tim, um, Tim two minutes. Yeah. So we've got fine sediments, which I talked about. Um, we've got there, so you've got very poor monitoring. Again, 6 of 60, 9 of 60, that's how many isotopes are being monitored for out of the 60 or 59 that we're talking about. Your coastal sediments are very bad, only three of them actually, and I've looked at these uh, with help from, from um, colleagues in the group, um, three of them are upstream, watch at Blue Anchor, kill, and are not likely to get much radioactivity because the water's trending the other way. Three of them, six of them are downstream, um, only three of them represent fine silt, clay, organic sediment, which most of the um, americium and plutonium were attached to. So if you look at the Bristol Channel Coastal Critical Groups, these are the people, these are the, 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 the case studies that you've got to think about there. These are the case studies that I've shown you before. Two, so who, who is it? Who are they? So what are they going to be getting from dietary inhalation contact doses? People living where coastal floods occur. Seafood eaters are three on the list. Populations working in, in around the sea from contact dose. Population spending time on the time. Look at the look at the major lack of information. No modeling, no regular monitoring, no empirical observations, failure to update environmental parameters. So who does know? Well, my point is that the there's the industry, they've done everything that they do on doses to people is all modelled from as a result of the monitoring that they've done. My argument is that the monitoring is flawed because they don't get it together and they won't engage with emerging evidence. But academic and independent entities, research is based on some empirical evidence rather than none. Field work based on an understanding of the way marine radioactivity behaves. Um, and the academic and independent research outcomes are shown to be anomalous to those of industry and pro-nuclear governments. What you need to think is really, 
it isn't the best place to put a nuclear power station and the people who are managing the monitoring and the data gathering which is supposed to inform you about what the health and environmental impacts are appear to not understand how radioactivity behaves in the marine environment and when they are told how it behaves in the environment they don't want to engage with those issues at all they would rather we all just shut up and let them get away with it um, and I had to abbreviate there because I'm so long-winded but uh, I'll stop okay thank you